first and what, of course, I would believe the most important presentation of the day. This will be a, a joint presentation between myself, Fintan Byrne from TNS, and Mark Burrisford from Edward Dunn. The purpose of our presentation is to have a closer look at the trends in the payments value chain, to assess those trends and how they're impacting on the merchant's investments, and also provide a little bit of guidance or some ideas to help merchants understand where they should be making their investment in payments. So what are we basing our presentation on? Two things. Firstly, the extensive industry experience of both TNS and Edgar Dunn. And secondly, some specific research that we've just undertaken on this very topic. So first of all, just a little bit about TNS. I won't go into it too much. But TNS are central to the payments ecosystem. It's a big claim, but one I think we can stand over. We handle about 15 billion card transactions per annum globally. In the UK alone, we see about 75% of all card authorizations that take place. Our settlement gateway, we see 45% of all card volume transactions that happen in the UK. On the merchant side, nine out of 10 of the top merchants in the UK trust us for their payment authorizations. And we have over 25 years of experience in providing software to retailers, not just in the UK, but in Asia, the US, and across the rest of Europe. And not just offline, but online as well. We continue to play an important role in that value chain, because we've seen a lot of change happening. So we've been around seeing the migration from paper to electronic, the rollout of EMV, the growth of IP services, e-commerce, the birth of PCI DSS, and point-to-point -point encryption. But equally as important, what we've also seen is an awful lot of technology investments that have come and gone without gaining any traction in the marketplace. And it was around that very topic that we conducted some extensive research. This is a model that people would be familiar with. You know, we call it the, the value chain model. And our research we conducted, not just in Europe, but also across Asia and the US as well, to really understand what were the major trends across this entire stakeholder framework. So our research looked at all of those stakeholders, from consumers through to merchants, acquiring banks, card issuing schemes, but also all of the emerging payment uh, technology companies that are trying to interject themselves in the value chain. So one of the important things for us was that our uh, research was holistic because we have a clear understanding that trends in the payments industry will remain that just trends if they don't satisfy enough of the needs across the entire stakeholder framework. And we took a particular uh, angle uh, for this research on the consumer, really trying to understand what is the role of the consumer in the emerging payments. We've seen them playing an important role for two key reasons. The first reason, it is the consumer that will drive adoption. So without the consumer taking on and adopting the new payment technologies, they won't gain hold in the market. And the second reason, we believe, is that consumers are going to play an ever-increasing role because they're now taking ownership of an important part of the technology stack and that's actually going to drive a lot of activity in terms of payment acceptance. So now I'm going to hand over to Mark and Mark will take you through some of the key findings from the research uh, and particular insights in terms of what we think is going to drive payment acceptance going forward. Thank you very much Fintan and uh, thank you for inviting me to share some of the research um, that we conducted at the end of last year. So I think, you know, the, just before we sort of kick off, what, what TNS asked us to do when they commissioned the work for Megadon, we wanted to take a holistic approach, as Fintan mentioned, right across the framework, the stakeholder framework, the right across the value chain and the ecosystem of payments. And there were kind of three, or I should say six, sort of key 
areas that were themes that were coming out consistently uh, across the, the trends and the, and the various competitive analysis that we conducted and in market interviews. And starting at a, sort of 11 o'clock on the, on the dial, the value chain expansion, what we meant by that was uh, different stakeholders across the value chain was taking, playing a bigger role in the value chain. They were going beyond their area of competency, uh, such as payment schemes getting into becoming payment service providers, even issuing or competing against the banks, uh, merchants uh, playing as roles as banks, uh, point of sale manufacturers acting as uh, going beyond the de device delivery uh, and actually switching transactions and playing a role in the recurring revenue elements of the, of the value chain. Alternative payments um, are no longer nascent. Uh, consumers are a lot more comfortable with uh, using alternative forms of payment. PayPal, in, in, for example, uh, is probably considered to, to be a, a third scheme, potentially. New players are coming into the world. Uh, the MNOs want to be part of the, uh, the recurring revenue streams that, the, that they're losing airtime revenues. Apple and Facebook, we've, we've seen rumours of them playing new role within the, uh, the payments value chain. There's also new business models, uh, cloud computing, cloud-based cloud payments. Level Up in the US is combining loyalty and payment and are offering a new proposition to, to merchants. And of course, regulatory change is always going to be around, um, whether it's PCI DSS, point-to-point -point encryption, or uh, e-money, or new introduction of uh, schemes such as uh, payment institutions through the uh, payment services regulations. But the one thing that is consistent all the way through is the, the fact that consumers are comfortable with paying differently. Uh, the whole customer experience is, is being driven by partly by technology and merchants are having to think uh, very, very hard about uh, which horse to back in the future. And I think it's becoming a little bit more uh, confusing for the for the retailer. <coughs> Let's have a look at uh, some of the some of the sort of the historical um, different products that we've seen. The cards online and offline. Traditionally, payment cards have been very much offline and designed for an offline environment, a physical environment where they're being accepted at a point of sale. They've come online, not necessarily um, successfully. I mean, there's some obviously security challenges online, but then at the same time, there's been a number of e-wallets and prepaid models that are springing up around the world, either regionally based or, or very focused in particular niche markets. And of course, offline payments are new innovation around QR codes, I mentioned Level Up earlier, PayPal going into the online environment, uh, sorry, the offline environment, I should say, within store. There's Pingit, who effectively going beyond uh, a P2P environment. There's Contactless, and there's also Zap, that is actually expected to be launched this year. I think what we're finding is going to be convergence, and the convergence is going to be, uh, for the consumer, a more of a convenient um, uh, mechanism will be the, the smart mobile phone, where a com combination of an app or a mobile wallet uh, will be the, the preferred choice. And that convergence is, is going to be blurring the lines between what's online and offline. If you take a look at it from a retailer's point of view, it's quite confusing. It used to be simple 50 years ago. It used to be, uh, you know, cards, cash and check. They were the good old days. Then came along the internet and became more virtual, more digitized. And I think uh, what's, what's uh, particularly challenging for retailers is to understand these new technologies, which ones are going to be uh, relevant for their consumers. And I think that is it's an interesting uh, 
uh, fact that just in 2013, there was uh, over 190 degree, de 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 deals for startups and uh, over a billion dollars worth of investment being uh, ploughed into payment startups. So you can see that the, the investor community is, is looking at payments in an in a interesting way. And they are expecting that the balance of power is certainly changing from what traditionally was the banks and the card schemes that were dictating this, the standards. But now it's moving towards uh, the consumers and the merchants having more choice, more options, more solutions. And technology is certainly driving that. I think how consumers actually interacting with retailers has changed. They are really taking centre stage. Uh, they are pretty agnostic of the, the channel that they use. They are uh, interacting with retailers in different ways, different channels. Um, they're researching products online, on their mobile phone, on their tablet, and making purchases in store or online. So the, the, the journey, the customer journey is a lot more complicated. It's, uh, it's uh, becoming more confused. Um, it's, there's different use cases, and that, this is putting pressure on retailers to integrate what's happening at the front office and what's happening at the back office. That integration, sharing information uh, across the different uh, systems and the legacy systems that exist within retailers is become uh, more, more uh, predominant in their, in their agenda in their developments and their investments in the future. And this is seen only last Christmas in some of the retailers who managed to understand the complexity of this uh, multi-channel approach were rewarded with uh, increased customer spend. I think what has been seen is that multi-channel retailers or multi-channel consumers are actually spending more and generating more footfall. footfall. So the connected commerce is um, and connecting with consumers in new ways has become very, very important. I think this is seen in click and collect, and this is uh, taken by you know taken a lot of retailers by surprise in some ways. It's almost it's quite hard to find a retailer that isn't doing click and collect today. Um, it's certainly a best example of a multi-channel uh, uh, customer experience. Uh, they are. You know, retailers are seeing this as a, a great way of increasing footfall, increasing spend in store. It's driving customers back in store. And I think, in fact, John Lewis only last year said that 30% of their click and collect customers are actually paying and buying new things uh, while they're in store, while they're collecting. So that halo effect is certainly realistic. I think that's put uh, some pressure on the technology providers. Uh, having to uh, deal with the security, the PCI challenges, and the need to have a tokenized solution across the different channels. <clears throat> and I think the ultimate shopping basket is potentially the mobile phone, where the, the device, the actual mobile phone, acts as a shopping basket where you can actually scan uh, uh, QR codes or bar barcodes of images of products and you've all seen this I'm sure you're familiar with uh, what Tesco were doing in South Korea with the home brand uh, home plus brand uh, in metro stations and subways where you can uh, scan products and uh, fill up your virtual shopping basket and have goods and products uh, delivered to your home um, likewise uh, Tesco have experimented in Gatwick in, in London and uh, Carrefour in Paris and uh, Lyon, and of course uh, Procter and Gamble are effectively cutting out the middleman and cutting out the uh, the, the retailer entirely, and uh, creating pop-up shops across uh, the U.S., uh, allowing consumers to the convenience of shopping online and not lugging heavy products home and having them home delivered. I think uh, the digitization and the virtualization is seen. In a number of examples around the world, um, Adidas and also Nike have digitised their store uh, in-store experience, and this is uh, engaging customers in new ways. 
uh, combining um, effectively an entertainment uh, destination and entertaining consumers uh, in, a, in a retailing environment. Uh, added a uh, virtual wall, they can look at products, you can drill down, uh, look at the, the uh, uh, customer reviews from Facebook and, and Twitter feeds. Uh, Mark Spencer is an example where you can look at other products, have them delivered in store or have them delivered at home it's through their kiosk. Uh, Nike, I mentioned the fuel station, is very interesting to look at the, what they're doing there around digitisation of the physical store. Uh, Burberry is a great example in Regent Street, have a look at that. Argos are also piloting this. I mean, effectively, Disneyland is it's always traditionally been an entertainment destination for retailers. And I think that is uh, coming through uh, very much in the, in the high street. And then one step beyond, I think uh, Cisco piloted with, also with John Lewis, the virtual mirrors, where you're effectively, um, you know, you're superimposing uh, clothes onto a, a reflection of yourself. Um, uh, they, they've discontinued this in John Lewis, but uh, there's a number of pilots around the world, and it's not beyond the wit of man that this eventually will be a payment mechanism as well. And uh, of course, it's uh, no presentation about payments without, uh, without mentioning mobility. Um, I think this is probably going to have the greatest impact on the customer experience in store. Uh, large retailers are looking at MPOS as a, as a solution, as a, a means of personalising shopping experience, a face-to-face -face experience. You can effectively transact and interact with the consumer wherever you are. I was in Heels, the furniture store recently, sitting on a sofa uh, one, one Saturday afternoon on a long shopping hall. And uh, the shopping assistant was able to come to me at the, at the sofa with a tablet, uh, with all the information about the different products, about the sofa, the different materials, the delivery time, the expected, you know, uh, the expectation will be where I can actually order that sofa at, while I'm sitting there, wherever I am in the store. So I think this is going to revolutionize uh, the, the retailer uh, environment. Again, integration, uh, with, with both the, the, the back end and the front end, and the inventory control, the logistics, etc., is, uh, is uh, not quite there. I think, um, I think a lot of retailers are looking at this. It's not quite ready as enterprise ready, but uh, some of the end pass solutions, but they will be there very, very soon. And of course, contactless is a, a stepping stone towards um, NFC. I think. Uh, very much uh, progressive contactless countries and uh, nascent countries which are going to be becoming more familiar with with the consumer experience. I think there's a combination of consumers and merchants awareness is part of the problem. In fact, as some consumers, they think the symbol actually means Wi-Fi in store. Um, and certainly not a, a contactless in, in environment. I think QSRs and quick service restaurants and coffee shops are seeing uh, very much uh, an increased uh, acceptance of contactless. Consumers are com comfortable with it, the concept. Uh, only yesterday I actually had a, 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 an unusual contactless experience where I was actually overcharged and I actually asked for a refund. And it took two shopping assistants to sort out the refund uh, on a contactless payment. So obviously still some training needs to be done there. So it is, a, it is naturally the evolution of the, the mag stripe to EMV to contactless and of course I think the next step to, to fill the full circle is the, uh, is the mobile phone where you effectively uh, in store you can do a face to face transaction with a mobile phone com combined with an app. Uh, if it's greater than 20 euros then you can do a pin uh, app on the uh, authorization on the on the actual phone. I think this is a very very interesting area of development where non-payment transactions will become more uh, interesting for the consumer. Where transaction history, balance inquiry, uh, loyalty, redeeming loyalty, earning and burning points uh, will be the areas uh, 
uh, which will be more interactive for the, cons for the consumer. The device actually becomes a lot more powerful, uh, and there's a lot of a lot of players in this, such as the schemes, the non-banks, the Google that you've seen in the US, uh, ISIS, ISIS, uh, the hand handset manufacturers all have have to play a role. Uh, of course, Apple are doing uh, Bluetooth. Um, not really taking on board the NFC technology, but going back down the uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy with their uh, eye beacons, which uh, should be an interesting development. We will see. But uh, Visa has certainly um, forecasted that half the transactions, electronic transactions, will be via the mobile phone uh, by 2020. So I think that's a probably a relatively conservative estimate in our study. So I'll hand you back, back to Finton to, uh, to talk about how that actually means for the, uh, for the retailers. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> so just on uh, contactless, uh, just on our payment gateway alone, we're seeing the number of merchants now accepting contactless. That's doubled in the last 12 months. Uh, we're seeing it expanding out of the QSR sector into um, off-licenses, supermarkets, and that's driving a very significant, more than a tenfold increase in contactless transactions just across our own gateway in the last 12 months. So how should we retailers be thinking about and responding to all of these various technologies that are emerging? So just from one part of our research alone, you know, the way consumers shop and pay, and remember that was just one segment of the research that we took, we're seeing significant shifts in terms of consumer behavior, in terms of the use of technology, particularly around the mobile phone, payment options, and different business models that will emerge for both merchants and consumers and acquirers uh, through this investment. So what must merchants consider? Must consider particularly which sector you're operating in and which of these technologies are going to be most relevant for your sector. Another really important consideration that came out in the research was the demographics and particularly the age profile of the consumers that you're going to be uh, targeting within your business. One of the other key areas that came out was where are you in your tech refresh cycle? So when you're about to press the button on the investment, exactly where are you in terms of the refresh cycle and how long is that going to take before it starts to pay off? And then the final one of course is the mix of channel usage and how your consumers and your customers are going to use your particular channels. But the research, some additional research has been conducted and that consistently shows that no matter what the payment method that's being used or the payment acceptance or the payment token, there's some core principles that don't change and they overlay any investment. So this was research conducted by Edgar Dunn in October of last year. So this was 80 multi-channel merchants across four countries. And they've consistently shown that security and simplicity are the most important considerations in terms of any payment investment or payment deployment. So whether it's click or collect, click or collect assisted selling, mobile payments, security, simplicity, reliability, will remain paramount in terms of getting the level of technology adoption and payment adoption for anything new that you want to deploy. And that is significantly still more important than other areas of alternative payments, which are important and must be considered, but the core requirements around security, simplicity and right reliability must overlay and continue to be upheld in any new deployment or you won't get the level of uh, technology adoption. So in conclusion, so where, what, what have we actually covered here uh, this morning? So from our research, we've tried to bring three important principles together. Firstly, around technology and the ever increasing impact on retailers, as Mark outlined, through the use of the, the growth of the internet and mobile payments, there's a lot of new technology investment opportunities and choices available for merchants. Secondly, that whatever value proposition that we go with, it must meet sufficient needs across the payment value chain for it to get the level of adoption that we require. But lastly, the core
core principles around security, reliability, consistency must be maintained or any investment that we make won't be sufficient to gain the level of adoption that we require. So thank you very much for your time. I uh, hope you've enjoyed our presentation. I hope it's given you some insights into the research that we've conducted, some ideas about the investments and the choices merchants will need to make. Um, if you want to come and join us, we're at stand 524. Uh, please come and do that. We have some drinks and some muffins available for you there. Mark and I will both be there to answer any questions that you may have. And once again, on behalf of Mark and myself, thank you very much for your time this morning.